Hello, these are the solutions to recitation activity nine. This activity will cover the final two sections in chapter nine on molecular orbital theory, and it will cover chapter 10. So the first question here is to describe MO theory, or to use MO theory to describe the orbitals and configurations of H2 minus. Let's actually try to describe a couple different molecules. Let's try to describe H2. Let's try to describe H2 with a positive charge versus H2 with a negative charge, and maybe even look at helium-2. So using MO theory, the idea would be that we can have a 1s orbital. So picture, let's start with H2. So imagine we have one electron in a 1s orbital, so spinning around an orbital looks like this. We have another electron spinning around an orbital that is spinning like this, and that these two electrons can overlap their spins, and they can fill into a bonding orbital that, in terms of our two nuclei, was going to put the maximum probability of finding that electron in some symmetrical orbital. So the spacing, or, or the shading, I'm sorry, is going to be highest for this orbital in between the two nuclei. So these are the nuclei of the atoms. So the greatest probability of finding this electron is going to be in between the two nuclei. And this is what we call a sigma bond. So this type of bond is a sigma bond, and it's made about by the 1s atomic orbitals. And so this is the 1s orbital of the one atom, the 1s of the uh, other atom. So the 1s of the other atom. And then we could also imagine there's this empty orbital that would be what we call the antibonding orbital. And the antibonding orbital, which luckily for, this, for H2 doesn't need to put any electrons into it, this would be maximally putting electrons away from the, the nuclear axis. And then we actually have one of these nodes in the middle a point of no probability. So we have a region of, of zero probability in between the nuclei, and then our greatest probability of finding the electron is now away from the two nuclei. And so for H2, we're going to put two electrons into the 1s orbital. So if we're doing a couple things, like if we're writing configurations, we don't do this too often, but you could say hydrogen's configuration is a 1s, or excuse me, a sigma 1s for the sigma bond comprised of the 1s orbitals with two electrons. And then if we want to kick an electron out, go to H2+, plus. we're going to just remove one of these electrons. So H2+, plus is just a sigma 1s with one electron. And then if we want to do the configuration of H2 with a negative charge, which probably isn't going to be the most common ion we encounter in nature, but if we add an extra electron, we're going to put it into the sigma star 1s. So we'd have a sigma 1s with two electrons followed by a sigma 1s star with one electron. Now our bond order is how many net bonding electron pairs are there. So our bond order calculation is a half, and then our bonding electrons, the total number of bonding electrons minus the total number of anti-bonding electrons. So we take the difference between the bonding electrons and the anti-bonding electrons. So for hydrogen, that's a half, two minus zero for one, so a single bond for H2, for H2 with a positive charge, it's a half one minus zero for a half. So you can have fractional bond orders in MO theory. That's totally reasonable. The bond order for H2 minus would be one half, um, not three, one half two bonding electrons minus one anti-bonding electrons for one half. So H2 plus and H2 minus have the same bond order. Um, the average bond order is a half or half a bond for that molecule. Then if we want to look at helium 2 or H2 with a 2 minus charge, we add a second electron. We're just going to put one more electron into the 1s orbital here. And so then that gives us the configuration of sigma 1s2, um, sigma 1s star 2. And the bond order here would be a half two minus two for zero. So helium two is not going to exist as a stable molecule as a result of there not being a bond for that molecule. Okay, question two. So we're moving on to looking at the molecular orbital diagrams of molecules into the second row of the periodic table. We provide you with these base diagrams on exams so that you don't have to memorize the diagrams. But the only difference between the two diagrams are these two energy levels and these two energy levels. So it just becomes a matter of where those two energy levels are relative to each other. 
Um, and so for, for this diagram here, we use this for B2, C2, N2 and their ions, and then O2, F2, neon 2 and their ions. And so we just have two different charts. And the only difference, again, is if you have the one, then the two, or the two, then the one, and everything else looks very similar. In terms of the labeling of this diagram, the way we can label this diagram, we have our 2s orbitals and our 2p orbitals for the sort of native atom. So if we're picturing, let's say, uh, nitrogen over here and nitrogen over here, it's like picturing that for N2, in the middle, you have your two nitrogen atoms. So nitrogen's a 2s2, 2p3 configuration. So you're just kind of picturing over here your nitrogen atom. And what's over here is just the end of the, the one, the end of the other, so that they can overlap together, make their MOs in the middle. What's really important for N2 is in the middle of the diagram here is that you get the sigma 2s and the sigma star 2s. So the bond that goes down, that's our bonding orbital. And then our antibonding orbital goes up. So we get our sigma and our sigma star. Then we get our pi 2p. That's one that there's two of. And then our sigma 2p. And then we get our pi star 2p. And then our sigma star 2p, the antibonding orbitals that go up. And so then in terms of what these orbitals look like, these orbitals look like you, it's maybe a little bit tricky to picture, but just picture two nitrogen atoms. You have their S orbitals and you have their P orbitals about each of the atoms. And so then you can kind of see, we get the 2P overlap here. This is what's going to make up between these two orbitals here, our sigma 2P. So that's, um, look like a highlighter. So that's this orbital here. So that's this bond is our sigma 2P. And then we have these orbitals, this, the 2p orbitals that can overlap together. These make the pi 2p, so that's our pi bond. And so that's one of these orbitals here. And then you get the other one sticking, I'm not going to drop it, you get a second p orbital sticking out of the plane. That's why we have, have two p orbitals. So we have p orbital number one, p orbital number two. So those are our pi bonds, so that's our pi 2p. And then our sigma, like the s orbitals, let me show these in green. Let me go to the highlighter. So the green orbital, the green orbitals can overlap. The s orbitals overlap, and that's this bonding orbital here. So that's our sigma 2s. That's what it kind of looks like. So it looks kind of like the sigma 1s from the H2 molecule in the previous problem, but now for nitrogen. So that's our sigma. Um, so this is our sigma 2s, and then each of those have their antibonding orbitals. So the sigma star 2s would look something like our two nuclei, putting the density over here and here. So it looks something like, that looks kind of like a sphere over here and a sphere over here, where that's where we have the greatest probability of finding an electron. And then our pi 2p orbitals and our sigma 2p, so the the sigma star 2p, and let me switch colors here for, let's go back to red. So for our sigma 2p, just picture the 2p orbital having a greater probability, but away from the nucleus. We have our other nuclei, so the greater probability of finding the electron is far away from the nucleus. So this is our sigma 2p, and then our pi star 2p just looks kind of like our p orbitals is bending away from the nuclei. So it kind of looks like, in a way, like a butterfly, but it's just the probability is now away from the nuclei where we expect to find our electrons. So that's our pi star 2p. Okay, now, you can picture the orbitals. That's great. You can understand that we get planar type orbitals and we get uh, bond symmetric type orbitals. But the key is for something like N2, which, so the question is being asked, According to their MO diagrams, which molecules below is paramagnetic and hence would be drawn into a magnetic field? You can probably answer this without even doing anything because the whole reason we're even talking about this topic is that O2 is paramagnetic. And you can see it with its diagram and all the others here will be um, diamagnetic spin paired. So if I'm filling into N2, I got to fill 10 electrons in. So nitrogen has 10 electrons. So I go 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. And so you're just looking, two nitrogen atoms have a total of 10 valence electrons, so I'm putting 10 valence electrons into my MO diagram for N2. 
and all those electrons are spin paired. So N2 is diamagnetic. If I want to do C2 for uh, dicarbon, I have to kick two electrons out. So the difference between C2 and O2 is C2 only has eight electrons and two has 10 electrons. So if I kick these two electrons out here, I still have all my electrons spin paired. So that's diamagnetic. And if I come over here for oxygen, I'd have 2s2, 2p4s, just showing having 2, 4, 6 valence electrons per O atom. So O2 has 12 electrons. So I'm going to fill 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, and then 12. My last two electrons are going into the pi star orbital, of which there's two of which we follow Hund's rule. So we're just applying the same rule out of chapter uh, uh, five of maximizing the use of space around those molecules, spin pairing the electrons into the same direction. So I get unpaired electrons and O2 is paramagnetic due to the unpaired electrons. And then if we go to F2, so if we look at F2, the difference between O2 and F2 is F2 has 14 electrons so 14 electrons, we go two more, spin pair those electrons. We end up having spin paired electrons here, diamagnetic for F2. So O2 is the only molecule on that list that is paramagnetic. We can use MO diagrams to help us predict bond length trends because if we're looking at, you know, if we're thinking of like Lewis structures for boron, we might be thinking, is it triple bond? or is it a single bond? And neither one of these maybe according to Lewis structure theory would be any better than the other. So we're gonna to try to see through MO theory, which kind of picture makes more sense. And then the same thing, we kind of see the Lewis structure for oxygen look like this, but we might double check, do we really have a bond order of two? And then for what's the other molecule here, nitrogen, um, probably a bond order of three, but let's think back to, let's do boron first here. So let's do a boron atom should have a 2s2, 2p1 configuration, three valence electrons. So it should look something like this. And then we're going to go two, four, and then six electrons. So B2 would be paramagnetic like O2 is, two unpaired electrons. And, but our bond order for B2 is going to be equal to a half, and I get four bonding electrons. These four electrons here are my bonding electrons, but these two electrons are my anti-bonding electrons, so I gotta subtract two. So that gives me a bond order of a half four minus two of just a single bond. So B2 is gonna look more like this here. So the, the effect of having a bond broken by its anti-bonding pairs, that's what we think of as being lone pairs. That kind of gives us our two lone pairs on boron, and then we get our net bond here actually being two halves of pi bonds. So we kind of have this single bond here is actually a pi bond or a net pi bond. It's actually like, if you think of what it is, it's oh, you get this bond here and then you get the other one flipping it out of the plane. So you get one electron in this orbital, one in the other orbital. So, but anyways, bond order of one for B2. If I go to then uh, O2, or let's do um, N2 next. So N2 is over here in this diagram. So we did B2 in red. Let me make sure I write that in red. And then let's do nitrogen in blue. So nitrogen just has 10 electrons. We add four more electrons. And so the bond order of N2 would be one half. And then we have a total now of eight bonding electrons. The maximum number you can have according to MO theory is eight bonding electrons in our MO diagram. Then we only have two anti-bonding electrons still, so that gives us a bond order of three for a triple bond. So we have the triple bond we expect for nitrogen. And then of course, O2 is a double bond. And so O2, we did this diagram earlier, so it's gonna fill in pretty quickly, two, four, six, eight, 10, and then 12. And to show our bond order calculation for O2, it's equal to a half, max eight bonding electrons, and we have four anti-bonding electrons. And let me just circle the four anti-bonding to be clear. And so that's our four anti-bonding electrons. So that gives us a bond order of two, a double bond. And so our single bond should be longer than our double bond should be longer than our triple bond. So therefore we have the B2 bond being longer than O2 being longer than N2. And then just flipping it, N2 should be the shortest, then O2, then B2.
So moving on to some chapter 10 questions, we have which uh, the pressure of a gas is inversely proportional to which property. So pressure goes inversely proportional to volume. If you decrease the volume of a gas sample, you're going to increase its pressure. Think about having a gas sample where you press down on a piston. The pressure is going to increase as you press down on the piston. That's keeping a constant temperature and amount of gas. And then um, pressure, if you think of the relationship to temperature, this is going to be direct. So if you have a closed container, so imagine you have a container that's sealed, has some gas in it. If you increase the temperature of the gas, then you have to increase the pressure as a result. So you're going to increase the pressure as you increase the temperature. So they're directly related to each other. So only volume is inversely proportional. Question five, the Goodyear blimp contains uh, 5.1 times 10 to the six liters of helium um, at 24 degrees C and 760 Tor. How much helium does the blimp contain in liters? Or excuse me, how much helium does the blimp contain in kilograms? And so the way we can get at the amount of helium in this um, uh, blimp would be PV is equal to NRT. And so we know the volume, we know the pressure, we know the temperature. So we should be able to calculate the moles, and that's the amount. So from N, we should be able to calculate the mass of helium inside the, the blimp. So I have PV over RT, and so that should be equal to, and I'm going to use 760, excuse me, 770 is the amount of pressure inside. So 770 Tor. And I'm going to go ahead and convert that into ATM. So I can use my usual units of the gas constant for R. I'm going to multiply by 5.1 times 10 to the 6 uh, liters. And then I'm going to divide by 0 0.08206 liter ATM per mole Kelvin. And so I wanted to go to ATM here to cancel ATM here. And I keep my liters here to cancel liters there. And I need to convert my temperature to degree C. So 24 degrees C will be 297 Kelvin. So it's just 273 plus 24. So that's 297 Kelvin. And so if we do that math, just over an ATM. So 770 divided by 760 times 5.1 e to the 6 divided by point, point zero eight two zero six, and then 297. So that gives me 2.12 times 10 to the 5 moles of helium. And then we should be able to work that into the mass. So the number of kilograms of helium would be equal to this number of moles to uh, just two sig figs here. So 2.12 times 10 to the 5 moles of helium. One mole of helium is 4.00 grams. And then, of course, 1,000 grams per kilogram. So that gives me 850 kilograms. So it's 8.5 times 10 to the 2 kilograms. Moving on to number 6 here. So we have a sample of an ideal gas. Now, an ideal gas is just a, a gas that doesn't have intermolecular forces um, that behaves according to the ideal gas constant or the ideal gas equation. So we have uh, a volume of half a liter, 25 at this pressure. What volume would the gas have at 75 degrees C and 3.6 atm? So we have um, we have some sort of a container that has you know perhaps a movable piston, and the temperature can change in this container. So the temperature is able to be changed, the volume can be changed, but it's airtight somehow. So we have a sample of an ideal gas at some initial volume, some initial temperature, some an initial. Uh, pressure. So if I'm thinking PV is equal to NRT, I'm thinking the only thing that's constant here is R and the actual constant R. So 
So if I have PV over T is equal to NR, NR is not changing. So I have these initial conditions in my container and I should be able to change those relative to each other to be PV, uh, P2V2 over T2 and that they equal N times R, the same N value, the same R value. So therefore they have to be equal to each other. So I have P1V1 over T1 equals P2V2 over T2. And so then I want to know V2 once I change the pressure and I change the temperature. And so my, I'm going to write this over here, but my V2 should be equal to P1 V1 times T2 and then divide by T1 and P2. So I'm just basically solving this equation here for V2. So multiplying T2 over to here and then dividing by P2 over to here to solve for V2. And so then I can plug into my equation here. Um, so I'm going to plug in 1.2 ATM times half a liter times T2. Now I got to go to Kelvin. That's the, the big detail here is we got to convert these to Kelvin. So this is 298 Kelvin and this is 348 Kelvin. So I got to multiply by T2, 348 Kelvin. Then I'm going to divide by T1, 298 Kelvin, and then times P2, 3.60 ATM. So we are, what are we doing here? We're increasing the temperature and increasing the pressure. So we're probably cutting the volume here by quite a bit. So we're probably reducing the volume, I think is what we're doing to this container times 0.5. So 1.2 times 0.5 times 348 divided by 298 divided by 3.6. And so, yep, we've reduced the volume of our container down to 0 0.195 liters. And so we've taken a container, maybe with a movable piston, we've dropped the piston down, but we've also increased the temperature as well. And then we've recalculated the, the pressure as a result of this change. And so that should be the new volume of 0.195 liters. Now the key here is that we can just use our ideal gas law, see how our three variables can relate to each other through a change of those variables, but the multiplication, the P1V1 over T1, has to maintain itself in the P2V2 over T2 because they both must be equal to the same NR constants. Question seven, which molecule below would effuse from a pinhole the fastest? So imagine we have a gas sample that contains, you know, particles that are, you know, CH4. We have particles that are, you know, O2, uh, water. We have particles that are, um, O2, and then we have particles inside this container. Um, so, so we have O2 particles uh, and we have helium particles. And so imagine each of these particles has a velocity. So helium is the lightest particle in this container. So helium is going to have the fastest velocity. And then um, if we're thinking of their molar masses, we got four grams per mole oxygen. We did in green, that's 32 grams per mole. Water's 18.02 grams per mole and CH4 is about 12 plus four. So that's, um, colors that I all do here. Um, so I was changing colors too fast, but um, let's do CH4. I, I think we need something in red, so we'll have that CH4 is 16.04 grams per mole. So the key is that the helium is going to be moving the fastest because it's the lightest particle of the three. And so helium, in terms of its root mean square velocity, is going to be very, very fast. So if we have a little pinhole, so imagine we have a pinhole here, and every time a particle hits this spot here, so imagine we have a helium particle, I don't want that um, highlighter, let's get back to the pen color. If we have a helium particle strike this pinhole, it can leave the cell. And so we have helium particles in this container. They're going to be bouncing around. They're going to hit the, that spot more often just because they're moving faster. And that slowest particle here is actually the O2 particle. So the O2 particle here, if we actually draw and think of its relative size, it's more massive. And so it's going to be moving slower. 
And so it has a lower likeliness of actually hitting the pinhole because it's just moving around the container with a lower velocity. And so the rate of effusion is going to be proportional to the effusion rate is proportional to the root mean square velocity. And so then the root mean square velocity, if you look at this, is equal to the square root of 3RT divided by the molar mass of a gas. And so as the molar mass of a sample increases, it's going to decrease. It has that inverse relationship. It's going to decrease in its velocity. So the more mass of the particle, the slower its overall velocity. And so this uh, O2 would be the slowest to effuse from the pinhole, and then helium will be the fastest. So helium effuses the fastest through a pinhole. And so um, at a given temperature, you can actually calculate the root mean square velocity. If you wanted to, you could calculate 3 times R times T divided by molar mass for each of these gases, and you'll see, of course, that helium has the highest overall root mean square velocity due to having the smallest overall mass. Question 8, we have a um, gas mixture that we're going to make by having oxygen over here. We have nitrogen over here. We have like a valve that's probably closed, but then we're going to open the valve. So we have a valve that's closed that we can then open so the two gases can exchange themselves. We have um, a higher pressure of oxygen here, a lower pressure of nitrogen over here. But you can imagine the two gases can exchange with each other and just move around the two containers and they're going to um, equilibrate um, through the mixing process. And so we have three liters of oxygen over here. We have two liters of one ATM of nitrogen over here. So we have a higher pressure here and a lower pressure over here. And so the idea is once we open the valve between the two gases and allow them to mix, then um, the oxygen can expand into the nitrogen container and nitrogen can also expand into the oxygen container. So you can think, okay, what happens to oxygen? The pressure of oxygen here is 2 ATM initially. So that's the pressure of O2 initially. And the initial volume is uh, 3 liters. But then we're going to expand up to a volume of 5 liters. So our V2 for both gases will be 5.0 liters. And so we're just expanding oxygen from 3 liters to 5 liters. And so we have a P1, V1 equals P2, V2 for oxygen that we can perhaps calculate for O2 first. That O2's pressure is going to have a new P2. This is for O2 from its P1, V1 over V2. So 3 liters times 2 ATM divided by 5 liters gives it a new pressure that is, I think, 1.2. Yep, 1.2 ATM. So we've expanded oxygen into a larger volume, so its pressure has dropped as a result. So that should hopefully make sense. And then the pressure changes for nitrogen. So the pressure of nitrogen, which was 1 ATM, is now going to lower as well because it's expanding to a greater volume. So for the pressure of, of um, the P2 for N2 is it's changing here in its container. We initially had 2 liters times 1.0 uh, ATM and now has a volume of 5 liters. So the pressure of ox or the pressure of nitrogen is now 0 0.40 ATM because it's 2 times 1 divided by 5. And so that's equal to 0.4. And now my total pressure, um, well, the question is asking for the partial pressure of oxygen once the mixing is complete should be 1.2 ATM. So the answer to this question is just asking for the partial pressure of oxygen, so that'd be 1.2 atm. But the total pressure in the container would be the partial pressure of O2 plus the partial pressure of N2, and so that total pressure should be 1.6 atm. And so sometimes this question could ask, well, what's the total pressure? And now, if we put this on a test, I guarantee you, if we said, okay, you have these two containers, they're going to exchange, we're going to open this valve between the two so the pressures can expand into the uh, volumes, a lot of people go with the answer is three. So a lot of people may think, well, two ATM mixing with one ATM should go to three ATM, but that's not quite right because the two, two ATM expands to a new volume, the one ATM gas expands to a new, new volume. Each of those pressures will lower as a result of moving to a new and increased volume. And then um, the, the two pressures actually will end up being between the two. So we end up with a total pressure that's about 1.6 ATM 
once these two quantities of gas mix together. Um, so the idea from Dalton's law of uh, pr partial pressures is the total pressure is just the sum of the individual partial pressures. So that's why we can sum these two up like we did to get 1.6 atm. And then you can also calculate the total pressure. This probably isn't so useful for this problem here. Or relate the total pressure by the mole fraction of a component, let's say the mole fraction of O2. So if you take the total pressure times the mole fraction of O2, that's a way of calculating the partial pressure of O2. So probably not necessarily a way I would think of solving this problem, but we do know the temperature of these gases. We know the volume and pressures. We could calculate the moles of O2, the moles of N2. We could calculate the total number of moles to relate to the total pressure, or we could relate the individual partial pressures here. So just, I guess, as a quick double check, well, this doesn't have too much to do with this problem here. Um, if we were to calculate, actually, I don't want to do this, but if we could calculate the moles of O2 and the mole fraction, X is the mole fraction. So it's the moles of O2 divided by the total moles. If we did a lot of math, we could figure out how many moles of O2 and N2 there were, add them up, calculate the mole fraction, and it should be um, the mole fraction of O2 should work out to be that ratio of um, uh, three quarters to give it a total pressure of 1.2. So kind of rambling here, kind of didn't need to go into this discussion here, but I just wanted to kind of relate a couple other equations to um, gas mixers. Let's take a look at question nine. So we have a mixture of N2 and O2. The mole fraction of N2 is 0 0.700. The total pressure of the mixture is 1.42 atm. What's the partial pressure of O2 in the mixture? And so let's think about how our partial pressures relate to mole fraction and what mole fractions are. So our mole fraction of N2 is equal to the moles of N2 divided by the total moles. That's what mole fraction is. And this is equal to 0 0.700. And because the total moles is just the sum of the moles of N2 plus the moles of O2, that if you had the equation for the XO2, where that's the moles of O2 divided by the moles of O2 plus the moles of N2, that this ratio must be equal to 0 0.300 because it's the moles are either N2 or they're O2 because those are the only two gases present in this mixture. And so the mole fraction of O2 has to be 0 0.3, uh, 0, 0. Another way of saying this is if 70% of the moles are N2, then the other 30% of the moles have to be due to the O2. Okay, and so then from Dalton's partial pressure, Dalton's law of partial pressures, the mole fraction of a component is equal to, excuse me, the partial pressure of a component, PI. So the partial pressure of a component is equal to the mole fraction of that component times the total pressure. So the partial pressure of oxygen should be equal to the mole fraction of oxygen times the total pressure, which is 1.42 atm. So the partial pressure in this container that's due to the oxygen should be 1.42 times 0.3. So that's 0 0.426 atm. And if we think, well, what's the partial, it's not asked here, but the partial pressure of N2 would be the mole fraction of N2 times 1.42 atm. And so that's 0.7 times 1.42, and that's 0.994. So 0.994, that's the N2 pressure, and then the 0.426, that's the partial pressure of O2. And so the answer to this question is that B should be the answer to the partial pressure of O2. And just a quick double check would be 0.994 plus 0.426 is equal to 1.42. So if I add these two values up here, I get my total pressure. Question 10, a two liter sample of air is warmed to 14 degrees C. What's the new volume in liters that the pressure remains constant? So we have um, just a, um, a change in volume and temperature. So this is just a uh, uh, Charles Law problem. So volume is directly proportional to temperature. And so here we have um, a constant pressure, a constant number of moles. So we have V over T is equal to um, a constant. Another constant would be, um, N 
times r divided by p. So that's our constant here. So we have a set of volume, temperature, uh, v1 over t1 is equal to nr over p. You could start as pv is equal to nrt if you want, divide by temperature over to here, divide by pressure over to here. So you have v over t equal to n times r over p. And if these are constant, if n and p are constant, not changing, then you have v2 over t2 would be equal also to n times r divided by p. Now v1 over t1 would simply have to maintain the equality to v2 over t2. And then the only detail is we have to convert our temperatures into Kelvin. I said it, I wrote it wrong. v1 over t1 equals v2 over t2. And so our v2 should be calculated as v1 over t1 and then times t2. So we just have to go to uh, Kelvin here. So everything in this chapter in chapter 10 should go to Kelvin. That's 296 Kelvin. And then 114 degrees C plus 273.15. That's 7, 8. That's 387 Kelvin. I'll double check sometimes. Screw up. So yeah, 387 Kelvin. And so then plugging in for my V2 as taking V1, uh, which was two liters at the cold temperature, we're warming it up, the volume should expand. So we should get expansion here. So I'm multiplying by 387 Kelvin, and then dividing by 296 Kelvin. So two times 387, divide by 296 gives me 2.61 liters. So I get 2.61 liters. But the key is you have to convert these temperatures to an absolute temperature scale. You cannot, it, it may look like your degree C's would cancel into each other, they don't. So you have to convert into an absolute temperature scale like Kelvin. And we get 2.61 liters. Final question of the kinetic molecular theory of gases assumes, um, so the kinetic, the, there's some postulates of the kinetic molecular theory of gases, like gases are not interacting particles that occupy a negligible portion of their containers. Um, and so gases are comprised of particles in random motion. That's a postulate of the kinetic molecular theory of gases. The size of the particles are negligible compared to the size of the container. That's another statement that's Indeed, um, a statement of the kinetic molecular theory of gases. Um, gas particles do not attract each other and repel. That's another statement. Um, but when gas particles collide, kinetic energy is conserved, not lost. And so D is an incorrect statement. So it's the one that is not said by the kinetic molecular theory of gases. So when gas, gas particles collide, so imagine you have a sample of helium, so a fast moving particle hits a slow moving particle of helium, they collide together, kinetic energy is conserved. What that means is if you have a fast particle hit a slow particle, the result would be two particles scatter off with um, a sum total of velocities that doesn't lead to a net gain or loss of energy through the collision. So energy is conserved in collisions according to the kinetic molecular theory of gases. All right, so that is it for this packet, and uh, thank you for listening.